I wanted to just highlight a few things that we saw prior to COVID as being one of the biggest challenges on remote teams. One of those is 50% of the remote workers felt disconnected from the companies that they worked for. And that was one of the biggest complaints that you got from remote team members that worked for companies. And then on the other side, companies' biggest fear was worker productivity. If I send people home, are they gonna be able to continue to work? How productive are they gonna be? Um, those are some of the bigger challenges that we saw and some of the things we addressed with the platform and the systems that we came up with. Then you had COVID hit, right? And then that it sort of changed the way remote workforces were working, the way companies were dealing with it. So what is new on top of that feeling disconnected in a remote environment and tracking productivity in a remote environment? And so I just wanted to highlight a few things that we saw a pretty big impact on um, from instant teams, which was companies having ba basically being forced into work from home situations, right? So they didn't have systems, they didn't have tools in place for that. So it was really quick um, and they were just forced into that. So not a lot of planning. Um, one thing that remote workers utilized a lot pre-COVID was co-working spaces. Co-working spaces to feel connected to other People, um, people that are extroverts that are working from home that kind of need a little more connection. A lot of them worked for co-working space. Will those close down? Then, as I'm sure you're all aware, spouses, children, family members at home. Like now, when you're working from home, there's other layers of complexity added onto that. And then with that was new responsibilities, homeschooling, those types of things. So you can imagine like all the policies and systems we put into place got stretched um, post-COVID. And also, um, you know, were extremely important for us to be able to continue operating. So I wanted to go over a few of those. So how do you make remote work um, successful in the current environment and what you have? And we have four main key ingredients that we do on a daily basis at Instant Teams and that we've developed that I wanna share with you. I'll highlight the four of them and then we'll go into each one of them separately in detail. Um, but one of the most important is really strong communication guidelines, including asynchronous communication, and I'll go over that. Um, intentional remote culture cultivation. It's really important that you're very intentional with how you build your remote culture. Setting work time boundaries. This is even more critical post-COVID that we've seen. And then clear core hour expectations. So being able to define what flexibility means in a remote work environment is extremely important because not, I, well, no one ever has the same definition of what flexible work means. And so it's important as a company that you define it for your workers and then you set those expectations so that people can understand um, how you wanna operate. So let's go over the first one a little bit in detail which is communication guidelines that I think is a really key important part of managing remote teams. Um, asynchronous, asynchronous communication. So if you're not familiar with this, this is the process of not real-time communication, but in it, being able to work and to communicate asynchronously would mean, so if I'm using, say, for example, Slack or some kind of messenger, that I'm sending a message, but I'm not expecting an immediate response. This is really important in the remote work environment that you set up an expectation of what that means and that you kind of ingrain that into your remote team. And along with asynchronous communication is also mindful communication. So we teach this a lot at Instant Teams, being mindful of how you communicate, because when you're communicating in a remote environment versus in person, a lot of times context, people add their own context to what you're saying. So if you're just sending a Slack message and it says one thing, they are interpreting it and reading it in another way. So making sure that you're mindful of how you're communicating that your team members are taught to communicate in detail and that they're taught to be mindful of how they're saying things because sometimes you have to kind of overcompensate in the remote environment for that. Another thing that we teach in communication is our communication ethos is to overserve, but not to overshare. So a tendency in remote teams or remote workers, um, sometimes the professionalism kind of goes down or um, some additional layers kind of come up and they'll tend to like overshare information, personal information, information about what's going on in the company, those types of things. So it's important to kind of let them know like we don't need to know every little detail, but um, teaching them to kind of get, be precise and be mindful in how they're communicating. 
Another thing that we do is offer daily updates. So when you're not in an in-person office environment, sometimes just your daily workflow may be detached from someone else's. And it's important for everybody to kind of get an overview and be stay in the loop. So we don't um, recommend you do tons of detailed updates, but just overviews of what you're working on, what's going on um, to keep those communication lines open. Um, be effective, quick and concise. So that goes back to my point, you know, you don't want to overshare. We don't need tons of information, but we need what you're saying to be communicated clearly and easily. And then this last one is burst the bubble. And all that means is you'll have remote workers that will tend to go off into their own silo and you will not hear from them unless you ask them specifically for information. So you have to train and teach your remote team members to be proactively involved in the company and proactively involved in conversations and to keep daily communication going, even if there's not something that they need to ask a question about so that they stay connected to what's going on in the company. This is my tips on the communication side for virtual meetings. So I've seen this especially um, in companies that are new to remote work or having remote workforces is to make sure that you limit your Zoom meetings, video conferencing meetings, whatever tool you're using, Microsoft Teams, you don't want to replace meetings and equate that to productivity. So what we see a lot of times is people want to schedule more meetings to make sure people are getting stuff done. And then all you're doing is really just wasting people's time by having a lot of meetings and then people get worn out and then they don't get any work done. So meetings don't equal productivity, just like they don't in the office, out of the office, right? So find other ways for touch points like those daily Slack roll updates, um, any kind of quick thing that someone can do to keep people in the loop without having to schedule tons of extra meetings. Um, one thing we do um, always is we always require video. So every meeting that Instant Teams has is a video meeting. This just enhances personal connections, keeps people from uh, wondering sometimes when you're on a meeting, if you've ever been on a meeting and you see somebody like typing the whole time or not paying attention, you know, you, you don't want that, right? So you want people engaged and you wanna have in a meeting where everybody is paying attention. So um, requiring video is one way to do that. Another thing that I discovered really in um, running virtual meetings, and I learned this this past year because every meeting we had is so succinct and you know it's boom 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 we got to get stuff done and what i realized is like the um overall morale of the team meetings was kind of low and so i started thinking okay how can how can i raise this a little bit so people are excited to get on the zoom call or we start off with a little more energy because you can most some zoom meetings are like they just dull from the beginning and they just kind of continue to go downhill so what i did is i implemented this company-wide so every zoom meeting starts with a win so I asked each member and I modeled it several times so that everyone kind of got comfortable because it takes a little bit. You may do it one or two times before people start to be comfortable with it. But I say to share a win, a quick win. It can be personal or it can be professional. And so I alternate and I'll share personal ones and I'll share professional ones so they know it's OK to share. But even just going around the room real quick and kind of bringing the energy level up really does help in the remote environment. So that's one strategy that I've implemented that has has worked out pretty good um so this is kind of a transition now we're going to talk about building remote culture like how do you do that and what are some of the strategies that you use in order to make the people that are that are working remotely feel engaged and connected to your company even when they're not in the office or you don't physically see them we do these are like two big um arches that I do. One is to leverage technology. So I'm sure you all use some kind of forms of this technology, but we mainly use Slack, Zoom, we use Office Vibe, but we've recently switched to Humaxa, and I'll go in a little detail of what those things are and why we use them. Um, so you, you want to leverage technology to help build your remote culture, but you also want to teach ownership. And I think this is really important because when in a remote team environment, you do not want people to silo themselves off and not still work collaboratively as a team. So what you don't want to hear and what I don't want to hear as a leader is that's not my job or I'm not responsible for that or I don't know, right? Because they're not connecting or communicating. I teach in my teams that ownership leads to solutions. So even if something wasn't your fault, not your department, maybe something that you weren't even tracking, by taking ownership of the situation, 
you can be part of the solution and create that cohesiveness that sometimes is missing in remote workforces and remote teams. So those are two um, strong areas that I would highly encourage you to spend some time on is training and teaching your people and demonstrating ownership at, in your leadership teams for your companies. So here's an example of how we use Slack to help build communities. So we use Slack as our messaging tool, but you could use um, the same strategy with any type of inner messaging tool that you have or that you've implemented. Um, I just did a screenshot of our community channel. So our community channel is what we use to give kudos to people on our team. This um, screenshot is an example of us welcoming a new team member and you can see everybody below dropping the emojis, replying in it. Um, this is just a, ch a channel we use to help build community so everyone gets recognized in there at some point, everyone feels part of the company. Um, another channel that we have in our Slack channel is a You First. And this is where we encourage um, mental and physical health. So we will talk, um, make sure people are taking time out of the day to take a walk or go on a jog and encourage them to post pictures of them exercising or, or reading a book or doing something that puts themselves first. So that's what that channel is dedicated towards. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, um, so this is a couple of tools we use um, specifically that integrate with Slack. So if you're interested in helping to get feedback from your team, this is what we use um, for that. Um, Office Vibe has a free Slack integration. It can get all kinds of information um, from your team members. So um, Net Promoter Score is one of them. You can do customized surveys in them. Um, you can track satisfaction of your team members. So it can be both anonymous and it can be um, you can get people's names and they can submit it as themselves as well. But it gives you a good pulse in how your workers are feeling. So if you have team members that are dissatisfied with something, sometimes they don't feel comfortable coming to you and saying it directly to you, but they would type it anonymously and submit it. So it gives you some good feedback. We have recently switched from Office Vibe to Humaxa. Um, because it has a little bit more customization. So, you know, I encourage you to look at both of those tools and see if it's something that you would want to um, integrate. The other one that we use is Donut, and Donut integrates into Slack and allows you to pair team members with each other just for like coffee dates. So if you have um, organization that you want people to feel like, hey, you know, this team member is in California and doesn't really work on the team that the person in New York is in, and maybe they want to get to know like the other people of the company, this is an easy way to do it. It's completely opt-in. So people can say, yes, I, you know, I want to do a donut this week or no, I don't want to do a donut this week. And um, it will, you know, pair them together. And a lot of our team members really like this. I opted out of the donut channel because I usually talk to everybody. Um, but, you know, it's definitely a, a cool tool to have in there to um, encourage like just communication across the company that doesn't necessarily have to do with work. So they just meet short period of times just to get to know each other. The other thing um, that we do on Slack for the culture building is open door appointments. So Erica and I, both co-founders and instant teams, we will put specific slots on our calendars for open door appointments. And basically this means anybody in the company can schedule some time with us if they just Maybe they don't know us very well and want to get to know us better. Maybe they have an idea or suggestion they want to bring to us, or maybe they have a problem they want to talk to. Whatever it is, they're open door, open topic. So we just have a few slots in our calendar, but we try to um, put ourselves out there so team members know that we're accessible and you know we're there for them if they need something. The other thing that we do is mental health check-ins. And I can't really stress this enough with the post-COVID environment because we've seen team members really struggle in the mental health department because there's a lot of things going on. And there's a lot of stressful things happening. There's a lot of different dynamics now working from home. And so what we do is we put this, these hearts in Slack with the colors, and then we just have team members check in and drop a color of a heart um, based on where they feel like they are mentally. And then if they're you know, black or orange, these colors, then we'll reach out to them personally and kind of have a chat on how they're feeling. But a lot of people will not come to you directly and say, hey, I'm struggling, I'm having a hard time lately. 
but if you initiate it and you open up a door for them to share, they'll start sharing the information with you. So I think this is really important. Even if you don't do hearts, but you find a way to incorporate incorporate it to where it's not intimidating and it's like, oh, I can drop a real heart or I can just be like, oh, I'm having a hard time today and and being able to share it. And then you can start to know how your teams are really feeling mentally is extremely important, especially right now. So here's some virtual team building um, ideas. So you'll notice, I thought I'd just share kind of a funny story with you if you don't care. Um, the top picture is me on a team meeting because Erica and I decided, you know, we'd be fun and we're going to just show up randomly dressed the same in this team meeting. So we downloaded this, it's a snap, a Snapchat filter for Zoom. And so we both showed up in this pink, you know, fur thing and uh, which was really fun and set a nice tone for the meeting. But then I was um, like two days later, I had a meeting, which is this next screenshot um, with you can see there's military people. So it was like an Air Force meeting. It's like an important meeting with some important leaders. And all of a sudden, my background changed to the sky floating like beside me, which, you know, being that I was on a call with the Air Force was kind of funny at the time. But I put that in there just so you know, be careful because some of these tools kind of just take over your camera and do whatever they want. Like I could not turn that thing off during the whole meeting. I could not figure out because this is a Microsoft Teams meeting and somehow that application, which was not open on my desktop, was still running in the background. So be careful on some of your more fun type things you're doing. But um, monthly, we do monthly trivia nights. Of course, we do holiday parties where we dress up. You know, that's kind of normal. We do co-working coffees. So if people want to just come in to a big Zoom room and hang out while they're working and then chat when they want to, we do that. We do some virtual fitness sessions. So we've done, we've had a personal trainer come in and do a uh, personal training session with us. You know, no equipment needed, that kind of thing, but everyone can turn off the camera, turn on the camera, whatever they're comfortable with, but leading us through to encourage, you know, activity because that's really big when you're managing a remote team, you want everybody to remain active. Um, and then we do personal development sessions and life coach sessions. So we do group ones and then we let people opt into one-on-one -on -one as well. If they wanted to do some more personal development sessions. But all of those things are just added benefits that we use to help build that culture for everyone to feel connected and to kind of hit the different areas that remote workers say they feel dissatisfied in, which is that connection, um, physical activity is another one that everyone tends to rate low when they're working on a remote team. So encouraging them to be active, encouraging um, you know, group fitness, those types of things I think are important and can really help your team's productivity increase. So I'm going to share a little bit about core hours and flexibility. I touched on this a little bit at the beginning that establishing what does flexible work look like is extremely important in your organization because everyone will have a different definition of what that means. Um, so you want to create policies that allow flexibility because remote workers want more responsibility, more ownership, more flexibility, but and but you want to add structure to that and you want to make sure you're not like micromanaging every minute of the day because you don't have time to do that, but you still want everyone to be um, productive. So what we did is we came up with core hour kind of block scheduling and built in flexible hours. So I'm going to show you an example of how we did it. So as I mentioned when I started, we have nine different time zones. So this is an example of some. But we have established core hours to where every time zone has a lap with another so we can make sure that communication still flows but there's built-in flex time before and after those core hours so everyone has for example the east coast team their core hours are 10 to 4. so what that means is they're expected to be online communicating responding to questions from 10 to 4. now how they spend the rest of their time if they want to do two hours after from four to six, if they want to do eight to 10, if they want to stack them on Thursdays, is up to them, right? But they're responsible for communicating during these time blocks and each time zone has them. So for example, Hawaii, since we're six hours behind the Eastern time zone, ours is seven to 1 p.m. So that our time overlaps a little bit with the East Coast, a little bit um, with Central time, and everyone can know, hey, Liza will respond between these hours. Of course, Liza responds all the time, but 
Um, for example, your, your bigger teams, you definitely want to set like specific core hours and then let them have flex time. Because what happens is if you have everybody, all your remote team members, all working flexible times, then you're always doing asynchronous communication. And that's not always the best to get things done, to get projects moving, um, to move things forward. So sometimes delays will occur in then. So I would encourage you to set some type of core hours. They don't have to be as long as this. They could be two or three hours a day. They could be three days a week. So, you know, whatever works best for your, your company and your culture. But I would set some of them so that you know there are some um, boundaries and some expectations, especially as your teams grow. Um, I don't know how big your teams are with everybody on the call, but when you have a large team, you know, getting a little bit more structured is important um, so that everyone knows when people are going to be online and when to communicate with them. The other thing that's in, extremely important in all of this is setting boundaries. And with COVID happening, I've seen this more in my team, that they feel like they need to be on all the time. And that happens when you're communicating asynchronously and people are in all kinds of time zones, that burnout is very likely. So you have to teach your team members to set boundaries and you as the company owner or you as the founder or you as the manager have to set the boundaries for them and make them stick to them. So during this time, I've literally had to tell team members, take time off, stop answering my, do not answer my email at midnight, you should be off by then, you know. And so one of the things we did to help encourage the boundaries, as you'll see in my, um, this picture, I have this digital human notice, but it goes out into every single one of my emails that basically says, I'm sending this at a time that works for me you respond at a time that works for you. I'm not expecting you to respond to me if I'm sending this to you at one in the morning for whatever reason I'm working at one in the morning. And those are the same types of things you have to bring back to your team members so they understand it's okay. It's okay to shut down because everyone needs to shut down, everyone needs to log off or they're gonna burn out. Um, they can set the do not disturb on their Slack, on their emails. Um, if you use a, a voice communication, like Box or Marco Polo or Google Voice, like making sure they set those boundaries and stick to them to prevent the burnout is really important. And I think um, even more so now, I've seen it at post COVID, I've seen it being more of an issue with our teams. And so we've, you know, really spent some time just asking them to set specific boundaries and make sure that, that they're turning off when they need to turn off. Because otherwise, if they're not used to working from home, the tendency is when you first start working from home is to be online all the time. And so you want to make sure you set the boundaries so that doesn't happen. I, um, that's kind of the highlights of what I wanted to talk about. I have three um, different PDFs that I was going to share um, with Shanoa or however you want to distribute them out to the people that are interested. But they are our core hours and flexibility policy written, our remote commun communication policy all written out in detail as well, and then our culture builders and strategies that we've used. So those topics that I hit. They're the actual guides that we develop that we use in house, and I'm happy to share those with anybody on uh, the webinar today that wants to get a, get a little bit more information or use those for your own companies as well. 